And we're back. Welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we're learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I'm your host, Raleigh Sadler. And if you know anything about me, you know that I am passionate about fighting human trafficking. In 2012, I moved to New York to start a nonprofit called Let My People Go that helped the local church address the evils of human trafficking. As you know, human trafficking is a $150 billion industry. There are cases in every country as well as every state. And over 50 million people are impacted around the world. Ben faced a dilemma as a journalist in Haiti. He was presented with the opportunity to buy a child. What would he do? Today, I'm joined by E. Benjamin Skinner, the author of A Crime So Monstrous and the founder and president of Transparentum. Ben, how you doing? Good. Good to be with you, Riley. So we're just going to talk about this just from the get go. Reality being what it is, is often something that we can try to avoid and be in denial of, or we can embrace it. And so as we're talking about human trafficking, we want to address that reality. We also want to address the reality that you're in New York City, and New York City is seldom quiet. And right now, the listener may hear some things in the background. This is real life. And so I'm glad that we can embrace this as we have the conversation. And so, Ben, you're sitting there in Haiti. And someone, this broker comes up to you, he calls himself a broker and he says, do you want a child? Tell me more about that. Like what happened? What did you do? So this was back in 2004, uh, 2004, 2005, after the coup of 2004 in Haiti. And I was embarking on a book project to, to write a book called uh, uh, A Crime So Monstrous face-to-face with modern-day slavery. And the first chapter of that book begins in Haiti. And I was interested in writing about the, the phenomenon, what they call the phenomenon, what really is a, a, a crime of child domestic servitude, which in, in Haiti is presented as a, a stopgap measure in, in some cultural circles, is presented as a stopgap measure to alleviate poverty. Rural families will send children with people that identify themselves first and foremost as friends. And what I found was a street there in a a, a very nice neighborhood in Petionville in um, in, in Port-au-Prince, where indeed a a man approached and said, "Uh, are you looking to procure a child. And I had no intention of, of buying a child, but I wanted to expose the trade. And so I went through the conversation and he made clear that this child at the end of the day could be acquired for the equivalent of 50 US dollars, that this child would be a principally a domestic uh, servant, unpaid. And there was one point where he kind of leaned in and he said, you know, this is rather a delicate question, but would you want this child as a, as a companion as well? And he, uh, he made it perfectly clear what he meant by, by companion. And so in that instance, I did not go through with the transaction. I fundamentally feel that all transactions, all purchases are moral decisions. This one, obviously far more saliently moral than those that we make on a daily basis. But every purchase decision we make is a moral decision. And I did not want to incentivize a trade in human misery. So I did not buy this, this child, which he, and I, uh, which he then would have, if I had put down money, he would have gone and broken up a family and taken this child in from, from the countryside. But what I did do, I think ultimately engendered a lot more responsibility on my part which is I went up into the highlands in the south of Haiti um, with an organization that worked with, with local communities that were being decimated by, by traffickers. And in the, in the morning, a, uh, a woman came to me and said, I need your help to get my daughter out of this, this situation of forced labor. And within a week, she had joined me in Port-au-Prince. I went in and found where her daughter was being held over the objections of the, the woman that was holding her. We took her out. And in, you know, I think what is so often forgotten 
when we talk about the the kind of the flashy work of raids and rescues is the real hard work is the the quiet heroism of the incremental care that takes place after that. And I said to the mother, you know, what do you need? I'm your partner in this now. What do you need in order to keep this young woman safe and help her help restore her childhood as she grows? And the she was this girl was 11 years old at the time, and she said, if I could afford to send her to school, then then I could keep her safe. I could keep her out of the clutch of traffickers. And I said, okay, as long as she's in school, I'll pay for it. You take care of her. And so I've, I've done that. And right up through, uh, actually last night, uh, I was uh, helping her get on now with her graduate studies. She's still in school. She is, you know, studying uh, to go and uh, give back to, to her community at the end of the day. But, you know, the heroism there was fleeting to go in into a, a situation of a little bit of danger to bring her out. But that's not the real heroism. What, the, the heroism is the courage of this young woman to, to seize her own freedom today, um, to make the courageous decisions to, to be an agent of her own liberation and of her now late mother to, to, to take on that responsibility. And so I think as we think through how to eradicate modern day slavery, we have to think about how to empower that quiet heroism. When you said three things that I want to touch on. One, you use the word transaction. And oftentimes in human trafficking, this is what it is. It's a trafficking in human beings, whether for domestic servitude, labor, sex trafficking, they are now a commodity and they are being objectified and they are a product in the eyes of their exploiter. And so there's a transaction where someone is trying to make money off their suffering. But also sometimes when we watch a movie and we see the hero's journey and this person goes and in the most beautifully paramilitaristic way rescues someone from the clutches of evil, we very often want to be that hero. We want to be the bold conqueror who comes in and just beats the bad guys to smithereens, rescues the girl, and fills whatever insecurity is driving us. This week, I've been thinking about this idea of, as a Christian, receiving a call from the Messiah versus receiving a call from my own Messiah complexes. And it's really easy to want to do something because Maybe I'm insecure about this. Maybe I got bullied on the playground, maybe whatever. But if I rescue someone, I feel better because I can't tell you, dude, I can't tell you how many people I've met over the years who tell me, you know what, dude, I'm called to fight human trafficking. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Tell me about it. And they'll be like, well, you know, I'm called to rescue the girls. I've heard that so many times. And you know what happens after they say that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Very few times do people actually do something because I don't really think it's even about the girls. I think it's about the person. I remember when I felt called to fight human trafficking, I'm thinking to myself, man, I wear cardigans. I'm not going to kick down the door of a brothel. What does it look like for me to do something against something as huge as modern day slavery? But if I really look into my own Messiah complexes, and if we really look into this desire, this almost mentality that's hellbent on rescue, we look into that, we see another transaction. So transactions on either side, and that's not going to help people who are created to be relational creatures, relational people. Humans are inherently built for relationship. And so in your story, yes, you got this person out, but it wasn't, to my recollection, your story was not necessarily a paramilitary rescue. Tell me a little bit more about mm -hmm. that. It was very relational how you did this. Yeah, look, uh, I'm a I'm a Quaker. We don't we don't do paramilitary very well, right? This was very much a a question of convincing a party who ultimately had no right to hold somebody, and the only thing was we didn't want this to come to violence, and it didn't come to violence. Right. But the real the real work was done afterwards, and you know when I think of the most effective anti-trafficking organizations in the world today. I think of organizations that first and foremost work with 
survivors, work with victims, work with vulnerable communities yeah. to help them understand their own rights and stand up for their own rights. Because at the end of the day, we, we all have to be agents of our own, uh, of our own liberation and our own happiness. A group like the, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers uh, mm -hmm. in Florida has been doing this quintessential work, quietly heroic work for, for decades now, where they have organized workers that are both vulnerable, in some cases victims, in some cases survivors of, of modern day slavery, and ensured that they can be agents of their own change. Most of those workers, they don't want to be you know, rescued, liberated, and, and, you know, with a whole bunch of fanfare, what they want is they want to do the jobs that they had migrated to do, and they want to build a better lives for their families. And then they want to move on from those jobs at some point when they've built a financial base. And, and in order for that to happen, they, they have to be able to realize their own rights. And the coalition of, of Immokalee workers, I think, does this terrifically. And critically, what they also do is they remind all of us that, again, those, those purchases that we make are moral decisions. And so they campaign to, to pay workers a penny more per pound for these, for tomatoes, for example. And they, and they push major corporations with significant profit margins to, to, to understand, you know, what you do eventually how you do business reflects not only um, uh, your values, but it accrues to the kind of world that we all want to live in and the kind of communities we want to live in. So I'm, you know, groups like the Human Trafficking Legal Center, which represent victims and survivors uh, with, with lawyers, groups that do that quiet incremental work, I think are, are really deserve so much more attention than than many groups that might render better for Hollywood, but at the end of the day are, are not part of the long-term solution. Yeah. And when we think of this in terms of mass media or Hollywood or anything where there's going to be a sensational take, yeah, it makes sense that we want to do the heroic thing. It makes sense that we want to do the bold thing. But one very good way to address human trafficking in everyday life is to think about the demand that we create through our own purchasing power. What you spend money on matters. And this isn't me just trying to pull a political card here or what have you. Let's just brass tacks, you know, Ben, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Are you ready? Are you ready to get down to the nitty gritty? Let's everyone loves talking about supply chains. Remember about a year ago, everyone was freaking out. They're like, I can't get my shoes. I can't get my this. I can't get my that. The supply chains, Walmart's struggling. Everyone's struggling because supply chains are just a whole ordeal right now. You know, ev everyone who's buying furniture is waiting like three to six months to get anything, you know, and it's just like, you're just sitting in on your floor, eating a pizza, hoping. And we were frustrated. But there's another side to supply chains. Everything that we enjoy, our clothing, our food, cinema, anything, our cars, the, the sheets on our bed, it has been touched by our unseen neighbors. Many people have been a part of delivering the products that we need and want. And so when you talk about basically your purchasing power is a moral decision, could you, one, describe supply chains for us into the part we can play in creating demand for the exploitation of our unseen neighbors. Yeah, as, as you put it, you know, we are all heavily dependent, certainly much, much more so than we were a uh, hundred years ago on a whole range of our, I love that term, our, our unseen neighbors. These are the people that we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to even though we'll never know their names, we'll never see their faces. And these are the people that are picking the cotton that went to the gins, that went to the uh, into the thread that made this t-shirt. Right. And the reason your t-shirt on average is less expensive, less expensive than it was 30 years ago, despite the fact that everything from a tank of gas to a year of college to the mortgage on your house 
is exponentially more expensive than it was three years ago. The reason for that is there has been a consistent downward pressure on price in, in the, in the apparel industry, in, in the, in the clothing industry in particular. And where that shakes out oftentimes is in human exploitation. And so at Transparentum, the nonprofit investigative group that I run, we have dedicated our ourselves to understanding where that exploitation is worse in supply chains. And we've been focused for the first seven years on apparel, but we're now looking at a whole range of other things. And what we found is it may not be in the in the people that are actually sewing the clothes, sometimes it is, but the farther upstream you go, the folks that are plucking the cotton, the folks that are spinning the thread in the textile mills, very often what you see is parts of the industry where child labor and forced labor and conditions under which I think any reasonable people would not want to work are the norm. And so th- that's the harsh reality. But the really harsh reality is that this is not a necessary feature of this industry or of any industry. It is only there because, as you put it, these are unseen neighbors. The second that they become seen and their voices become heard is the second that we begin to see change in industry. And we begin to see the pressure for companies to do the right thing. And so we're dedicated to, to digging that out, to exposing where it is and, and to bringing it first and foremost to those companies and saying, Hey, you have a responsibility to make it right by these workers. But if they won't, if they won't, that is where the law enforcement officials that are charged with stopping this stuff from coming in the United States, that's where they have a mandate at Customs and Border Protection. That is also where those of us that have our our pension funds, our 401ks, have a role to say we don't want to be invested in companies that are exploiting people in their supply chains. And critically, that's where, once again, those purchases that you make are moral decisions. And informing yourself about about how the products that that you are buying were made is part and parcel of making sure that you make that that moral decision justly and and righteously. Yeah, your personal choices have public ramifications. And we just don't think about that when we're trying to put fish sticks on the plates for the kids or mm. when we're just trying to be dressed somewhat nicely, but at an appropriate budget so that we can look good at work, but also, you know, not break the bank. But, you know, one of my friends, Jonathan Walton, would always say this. If you're not paying the full price, you can rest assured that someone else is. And Mm -hmm. I think that's very important for us to think about is that we do leave a footprint. We are going to leave a trail behind us with every choice we make. You and I were doing a panel discussion on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And we were joined by Justin Dillon, who started an organization called Made in a Free World, where they are making fair and free products to ultimately change the culture. But he also created a survey online called Slavery Footprint to help people know just how many people have been exploited by your personal choices. And me being, you know, someone who has been a pastor in a local church, I've been to seminary, I've done all these things. I look at this as an opportunity to gain perspective that could lead to repentance or a change, a turn where I'm no longer in this way living for myself, but I'm living for God and others. And that living for God kind of overflows into my love for others. But I'll never forget, you know, Justin said something like you said earlier. He said, you can talk morality. Morality is important. But he's like, you can talk morality all day long. It's not until you start messing with people's money that you see change. And it's Mm. always stuck with me that Mm. we are casting a vote with every dollar spent. 
we are casting a vote mm-hmm. with every click. So if we're watching pornography, we are contributing to someone else's exploitation in some way. People can push back and be mm-hmm. like, well, how do you know? I'm like, well, that's the kicker. You don't. But I can guarantee you that behind that smile could be this infinite amount of sadness, this trauma, this brokenness. Anyone can put on a smile and you are consuming. And so as we think of supply chains, my question is for all of us, are we consuming suffering or are we buying freedom? Because whatever we do, we are, we are making a choice and we are living into the world that we want to live into with everything that we do. And so what would you tell people who are thinking, yeah, 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 this is like meta, this is high level. But again, you know, I'm working 40, let's be real, 50 hours a week, taking care of the family, keeping the lights on. I mean, how are you going to make this real to me, Raleigh? How are you going to make this real to Mm. me, Ben? Mm. You know, it's a... um Going back to what you were saying, the, the, there's a, um, I, I'm reminded of my ancestors who, again, on my mother's side, Quaker, a long way back. And in the 19th century, in the run-up to the Civil War, one of my ancestors, who was a comb maker in Connecticut, he said he, he was, you know, railing against slavery and getting up in his soapbox in the town square, et cetera. And his, his Southern distributors came to him and said, you know, the, the, in the South, they've, they've caught wind of this and, and it's suppressing your, your sales. And he, he famously said, you know, if, if they won't buy my Yankee combs, let them go lousy. And, you know, there is a, there, uh, I think all of us have to understand there is a bit of sacrifice on our lifestyle that we have to, um, that we have to think about. If we are going to live justly, if we are going to live our values, there's another anecdote with the, in the Quaker meeting. This wasn't my direct family, but it's been passed down through it, where a, a visitor came to the Quaker meeting, which of course is, takes place all in silence and leaned over to a friend and said, you know, when does the, when does the service start? And the friend said, the, the service starts when the, the meeting ends. And that is very much, uh, I, I think how all of us, regardless of our faith, hopefully think about our lives, which is, you know, it, it is a, it is a through, through service we worship and, and through service we, we honor and critically through service we build the lives and the communities that I think we all hope to, to live ourselves and leave to our children. There's a, there's a very good website that Justin Dillon, who you mentioned, built with Made in a Free World called Slavery Footprint, which just gives you sort of an inkling. Uh, it gives you a, a sense of the kind of footprint that you have in terms of, in terms of modern day slavery. But the bottom line is, as long as the driver of the, uh, of the economy is consumption of things that are cheaper than they should be and that they would be with proper rights realization for the producers of those things, this economy is bound to be shaky. It's bound to be unsustainable. And, and so I, you know, I look at the apparel industry and those companies that have done well over the long term and those companies that have really profited not only for themselves, but for their workers are those that fundamentally take into account you have to pay people a living wage. And, and at the end of the day, they, they need to be able to walk away from their work if it's not for them. Two very simple, basic precepts. That we assume but, in um, our occupations, but not that everyone we assume gets in our own that, occupations. Yeah, not everyone gets that opportunity. Exactly, exactly. And this isn't to say that, um, you know, every worker who makes your t-shirt at, at all levels should be paid $15 an hour, you know, U.S. minimum wage. It, 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 it is to say that they need to be able to work with dignity and they need to be able to work in, in a way that allows them to leave that work um, if they have a better opportunity. And too many today do not. Well, you and I have a mutual friend who has an organization that works with people in South Asia and they're making products that they're selling and people are buying these products. And I once asked, I was like, well, how much are the people making? And she said, they're making 
like 300 times what they would make in any other job there. But we're not paying them necessarily what they would make in the States because that could honestly put them in danger. But they're like these people that are working for the company, they're buying homes, they're getting away from unhealthy marriages where they were kind of dependent. You know, they are actually being empowered in the safest way possible. And I think sometimes when people think about human trafficking, again, there's this, there's this piece that we just forget to think about. We just, it doesn't, it's not the first thing that comes to our mind. You're talking about service. I love that Quaker quote. The Mm. service begins when the meeting ends. That is so Mm. beautiful. So you have this Mm. idea of service, but I think it's good to break it down that there is a passive service. If this includes the conscientiousness of our purchasing, are we Mm. thinking through, like, I mean, seriously, you know, I'm trying to get healthier. I'm trying to watch what I eat. I look at labels sometimes. I don't really know what I'm reading, but I look at them and I at least count the calories or whatever. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, maybe I don't, I'm not going to do that. Maybe I am. I don't know. But another label we can look at is, is this fair trade? Is this direct trade? Is this mm. equal exchange? Is, is this local? You know, are these repurposed goods? There's things that we can ask of the mm. product that we're buying just to know more about it. You know, we always want to, We always want to read the labels when it concerns us, but it's really kind of hard to read the labels when it concerns others. And so I think it's very important for us to, one, have that passive service where we're actually just thinking through things. It's easy to not do that. It's very hard sometimes to pause just for a second to be like, okay, what's its story? What's the story behind this box of Oreos? I know Oreos are delicious. But is there a dark side to the chocolate production? Mm. Or, you know, you have the passive, but then you have the active service. And yeah, that's for me, you talk about your Quaker background. I think, you know, as someone who's come up through the evangelical world, I think there's the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. But then there's also Mm -hmm. the demonstration that we see worked out in justice and mercy. And there's acts. Yeah, there's acts of service for you. How has your Quaker background really encouraged you to be who you are and do what you do? You know, I I, I think part of it certainly is this, as you were talking and as we're discussing consumption, one of the, one of the, I think, really beautiful elements of, of Quakerism almost culturally is the idea of living simply so others can simply live. Wow. And the, this idea that by not over consuming a whole bunch of things that are very cheap, but by really thinking about what we buy and buying a few pieces of clothing, for example, that are, are well made, will last, but critically where we understand where they come from. Again, we can, we can serve just through those everyday decisions in that sense. And I think beyond that, I, I look at what the American Friends Service Committee has done, which won the Nobel Peace Prize several years back, and and the degree to which the work of peace building is intimately tied to the work of rights building and of fighting poverty. There's this view in certain circles that when you start talking about poverty, you're pulling away from what you should be focusing on, which is the criminals that are trafficking people and they need to be locked up. And, and, you know, those, those, those elements of forced labor and human trafficking that involve criminality are real. And law enforcement needs to obviously hold those who are committing crimes to account. But to deny the role of poverty in modern day slavery is to deny the role of gravity in rainfall. There is, it is an absolute driver for so many. And, you know, I know you talk, Raleigh, a lot about vulnerability and looking at those other elements of vulnerability, not just economic vulnerability, but um, psychological vulnerability, drug addiction, you know, how are we approaching those in our society whose migration status is, is undocumented? Right. Are we approaching right. them with compassion or are we approaching them as, 
as uh, perpetrators of a crime against the state. And I, and I would say that if, if we do the latter, we, we have to take a, a hard look at whether we are helping traffickers or whether we are helping the, the, the would-be victims of trafficking. You know, when we think of human trafficking, an easy way to describe it is the unlawful exploitation of vulnerability for commercial gain. Traffickers seize upon vulnerabilities like sharks in water. A shark senses blood. Mm. That blood points to a cut. That cut makes someone vulnerable. A trafficker can mm. do the same thing, whether it's someone looking for the affection of a father or looking for an honest day's work or someone who's just been using drugs or they've been plied with drugs to be exploited. Regardless, Mm -hmm. maybe they're dealing with some mental health issues that they can't seem to really get their hands around and Mm -hmm. someone else can leverage that and seize that for themselves. And Mm -hmm. when we think about vulnerability, we have to reconcile the fact that yes, when people ask, well, where are all, where, where are all these people who are trafficked? I always say, you know, they're hidden in plain sight right behind your assumptions. We don't get to choose the perfect, pretty people who are suffering. We kind of have this idea of the deserving poor versus the undeserving poor. And in, honestly, in my theology, we're all undeserving poor. We don't get to say, well, at least that person's trying, so I'll help them. And I think, I think there's, there's a struggle there. And I've said this before on the podcast, but those who are often victimized are the people that we naturally villainize. And we don't want to help them because they're bad people. We think in these black and white constructs rather than saying, maybe something broke for me that didn't break for them. Maybe there's an element of privilege in my life that they never had. Or maybe they did make mistakes and do terrible things, but do they deserve what's happening to them? And I think when we think like that, we're shifting from that transactional mindset that we discussed earlier back into this human, just fiercely human relational mindset of, Mm -hmm. do you really want this happening to a family member? Even if it's that outlaw cousin that you had that did wild things, ended up in jail a bunch of times, hurt people, but you knew at some level had a heart of gold. We need mm. to think through everything we do and at, like, especially the way we react to something like human traffic, because it's so easy to look for the wrong thing when the people who are being exploited are right in front of us and we just don't mm. want to see them. Using, using a real world example on this, you look at the Gilgo Beach murders, this, uh, this awful story as it's unfolding of this serial killer. and. Why was he targeting women that were selling sex? Because he knew nobody would care about them. And he knew nobody would would deal with them with compassion. And why did he get away with this for at least 13 years? It's because I think when it comes down to it, there was an attitude, passive or in some cases active, that these women had it coming. And that is a searing indictment of all of us. That is a searing indictment of all of us. If we approach men or women that are working in the sex industry as if they are not deserving of the same rights as the rest of us, we've failed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the flip side of that is I had a friend text me and ask, have you ever met a serial killer? And apparently he had crossed paths in a professional way with this person who has been arrested. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was this realistic notion that you do not know who the exploiters are. And oftentimes you don't know those who are being exploited, but it's very important that we keep our eyes open, our ears open, our ears to the ground and really focus on the vulnerabilities around us. And I think the stuff we bring to the table, like our own issues, we allow that to blind us from the needs of others. Like, it's very rare that you get to set up this perfect hero story. Sometimes you're just sitting down with someone and having a conversation. Sometimes it's a smile. Sometimes, I mean, relationships build in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But fighting human trafficking does not always include you kicking down the door of anything. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it begins with listening. 
and buying clothing that has not been tainted by exploitative management or anything like that. It's just, I've loved this conversation because throughout the conversation, we've kind of batted this idea around of relationship versus transaction. And as we kind of bring this, you know, conversation to a close, then I want to know what are a few things that we can do to address human trafficking here and now? Yeah, the, um, I think the, the first we've been discussing, um, and this is overarching and manifold and takes many different forms, but uh, as someone once said, love one another. Yeah, right? I've heard that. Um, I've heard that. Yeah, 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 that's the thing. And, and, and really understand and listen to the, those that are uh, in situations where they are likely more likely than not to be vulnerable to traffic. And, and uh, first and foremost, um, I think that involves reconciling our own biases, understanding our own biases, yeah. understanding where we tend to look past people or, or cast guilt at them uh, instead of uh, understanding our own responsibility. And then I think beyond that, really digging down deep, looking at our spend and understanding, again, those purchases that we make are moral decisions and, and make them with as much information as we can. And then finally, a corollary to that is ask these companies that we have in our pension funds, that we have in our, uh, in our 401ks, that we have uh, in our Amazon cart, you know, a- ask fundamentally, what are you doing to protect the workers in your supply chain? Have you even mapped your supply chain? Do you know where this stuff is coming from? You're selling it to me. That 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 too is a moral decision. You've made purchases up the line. Uh, you're representing to me that they, that these are clean of slavery, correct? And if and if those that we do business with, those that we invest in, can't answer that question clearly, I think we need to to, to press them to get better, or or move our money. I think this is something that all of us can and should and increasingly are doing in a, in a world where, you know, workers everywhere have the access to mobile telephones and, and social media. We have the ability to know and it behooves us to know. If you are interested in more conversations like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. If you want bonus episodes, as well as a plethora of other resources, become a paid member at lmpg.org for $10 a month. You will get access to our bonus podcast, More Mercy, where we dive deeper. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. We want to hear from you, so you can email us at info at mercycast.com. Till next time. Have mercy on yourselves and each other.